Okay, guys, let's get started. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, folks. We um, have a wonderful presentation for you today. We have Dr. Ken Kedziella. He's one of our clinicianers and he's also a faculty member at Midwestern. Um, he is has been so kind to do this presentation for us today. I'm gonna let him um, introduce himself here shortly, give us a little bio, and then we're gonna get started. Um, but for those of you that are just joining us, my name is Rebecca Mazur. I'm one of the academic managers for Aspen Dental. I actually run District 7. So thank you guys so much for showing up today. We have tons of students from District 7 um, and District 8. You guys are awesome. Um, this is just a little special webinar for you. Dr. Ken's very excited to present. Um, he has his presentation. We're gonna get started here shortly. Um, his presentation is uh, going to be cut up into different components. At the end of every component, we will give you guys the opportunity to ask questions. Um, and that those questions are directly to Dr. Ken. Again, he's one of our faculty members at Midwestern University. Um, you can put your questions in the QA box, um, and then I will pose those questions directly to Dr. Ken. Um, so with that being said, thank you guys so much again for joining us. Dr. Ken, take it away. OK, hello and welcome. Uh, thank you for having me, everybody. Um, I, my biography is I practiced dentistry for about 25 years outside of Chicago, Midwest. And uh, I sold my office and started working full-time for Aspen Dental. I worked for about a year and a half for Aspen Dental and then the Midwestern University Dental School opened up and I applied and, and I, was, I was accepted. So I started work, uh, teaching as a clinician on the floor and then I missed Aspen, and then we had a collegial um, agreement that I can come back part-time. So now I've been with Aspen for over 10 years, and I teach full-time at Midwestern University. Um, I will, uh, again, uh, um, start off with my newest addition to my family, and it's my puppy. His name is Benny. So right now, Rebecca, can I go ahead and share my PowerPoint? Absolutely, Dr. Ken, you can, you can uh, share your PowerPoint and we can get started with your presentation. Okay. You can click up there to Benny's picture if you want. Yes. You can scroll one over, there you go. Okay, all right, so everybody, uh, this is my newest addition. His name's Benny, and he's a West Highland Terrier, and he's the love of our life. Mary Lou and I, Mary Lou is my wife. She's a retired nurse, and so now we have a, um, and he's training us quite well. We're almost fully trained now. Okay, so again, thank you again for allowing me to do this. Uh, I have practiced oral surgery. I'm a general dentist. And I by no means claim to be an oral surgeon, but I do a lot of oral surgery. And uh, I was gonna hold off and talk about this last, this next comment to the end of the presentation, but I'm gonna talk about it right now. Uh, initially, uh, oral surgery has been very, very good to me. And uh, those of you who have been practicing surgery and like it and become proficient at it, it could be very lucrative. You know, the reason why there's no lab fee. So all that, that the, the financial end of it is all profit. And unlike Crown and Bridge and uh, some of the other components of dentistry, oral surgery, you can do very well in a very short period of time. Plus the patient loves to stay in your office to do the oral surgery instead of going to an oral surgery office. So um, I, I, again, I couldn't, uh, um, uh, promote the oral surgery more. It's just been good to me. And those of you who do like oral surgery, um, it, it could be very beneficial as well. So there will be five components of my presentation or uh, of the agenda. And again, those of you who do a lot of surgery, don't get bored with me. It gets better toward the end. But the first component will be the exodontia uh, the armamentarium, you know, the forceps and which forceps to use when and how and, and uh, all the uh, uh, goodies that go with it. Then we're going to have some case studies. You want to have some x-rays 
and I'm going to have a uh, choose the forcep question and you know certain uh, teeth require a different forceps. So you'll have some about 16 x-rays that go along with the forceps. It's a lot of fun, that section. After that, I will go into the sectioning procedures and uh, we'll talk about uh, maxillary tooth sectioning and mandibular tooth sectioning, mainly molars only. The fourth component will be dry socket management. Uh, by no means, when a dry socket occurs, is it is it, it anybody's fault? We just got to know how to manage it. So I'll be talking about the dry socket management. And lastly, treatment of oral antral communications when you're taking out maxillary molars or even some maxillary bicuspids. When you have an oral antral sinus perforation, I'll, I'll talk about how to treat that. So. Starting off, again, those of you who do surgery, don't get bored right off the get-go. It does get a lot better as we proceed. This is what our cassettes at Midwestern looks like. Um, you have your, your basic armamentarium, and then you choose a forcep that you have, uh, whatever tooth you're going to be extracting. I'll uh, start off with a bone file. Uh, bone files typically are only used in one direction. They only work when you pull the file toward you, not when you push it away. The flutes are angled only one way and they are only cutting and removing bone on a pull method rather than a push. So again, keep that in mind. A lot of times when you pull the file, you'll pick the file up and bring it forward again and pull it back. Pick it up, bring it forward and pull the file back along the ridge. And I just remembered any question, even if, it, if it's a tangent of oral surgery, feel free to ask me, I'll try my best to answer. Okay, a, a surgical curette, um, Everybody knows what this is. After the, the, sock, the tooth is removed, you wanna just cure up the walls of the socket. A lot of times this could be used to uh, initiate heme along the walls. If some of the socket walls have heavy lamina dura, there may not be a lot of uh, vitality right along that socket wall. So you wanna scrape that wall to create heme. Root tip pick. I love this instrument when you only have very, very small root tips left behind. A millimeter, two millimeters, three millimeters. But when you have like something like a half of a root tip, then you have to go into a much more heavier uh, root tip pick elevator instead of this. This is the double ended. And this is really primarily used only for small and very tiny root tips that are left behind. Okay, Ron Gears. Um, this is used um, a couple fashions incorrectly and I, it really, really bothers me sometimes. Students like to pick this up and use it as a forcep. It's not a forcep. It's, it was invented and made to modify bony ridges. There's a flat end at the bottom and that flat end is made to sit on the bony ridge and to cut bone. It's not made to extract teeth, but students like to pick it up because it's small. Instead of using that, you wanna use a root uh, tip forcep if you're looking for something to pick out a small root tip. But Ron Gears is not the forcep of choice. It's made to trim bone and to recontour bone. It's not used as a forcep. Okay, straight hemostat, everybody's well familiar with this. Um, you know, you can pick up your needles and, uh, and uh, then put the needle, you know, into your fingertip area, but you don't wanna pick up your needle first barehanded. You wanna use a, a hemostat and have, and to transfer the needle from the hemostat into your fingers to initiate uh, sutures. Okay. Um, Here's a periosteal saladin. 
Uh, I do not use this too often. It's primarily used when you're, when you're making very, very large flaps. Uh, once in a great while, I may use it, but again, it's there, but I'm not a big fan of it because I don't lay these big vertical release flaps like an oral surgeon would. Uh, I'll do a small flap and um, we can you will use uh, another instrument as we will see. Okay, a mouth prop. A, um, I'm not a fan of these and so many students like to put these in, in the patient's mouth and then uh, start working on teeth and extracting teeth. The problem I have is that when you put a mouth prop in a patient, the, the, they're, they're, they're propped open and their cheek is very taut and you, a lot of times to take out a tooth, you have to work from the buckle. So you have to have the patient close sometimes. So with that in mind, you have to, you have, to have them close and then you bring that in instrument or your, your, your uh, focus from coming from Dr. Ken, we lost you. Dr. Ken, can you hear me? Okay, Minnesota Retractor. Uh, there you are. This, this we was- We lost you for a second, Dr. Ken. Sure. Go ahead, continue. Okay, Minnesota Retractor. This was invented at the University of Minnesota and uh, the smaller end that curves up, the end on the left is primarily used to uh, retract the lip. The flatter end, the longer end, the one on the, on the right side of the retractor is used to retract the cheek. So again, I use this, it's nice, it's very handy, uh, but understand that the left end is very, very um, uh, useful when you're working to retract the lip. The, left, the right side is used to retract the cheek. Okay, number one, forcep. Um, this forcep is extremely straight. There's no contour to it. There's no bend. I don't use this that often. Uh, I would rather use a 150 forcep to take out maxillary incisors instead of, of the number one forcep. But uh, some people like it and that's, that's fine. Okay, 151 forcep, 151A. Uh, the A means apical. And uh, they're the 151 and they're the 151A. Uh, the difference is the 151A is used to go after some larger root tips. And if you notice a 151A, the beaks will be more parallel because they're made to fit right alongside the walls of the root tip. The 150, that's the 151A. The 151, you have more of a oval shaped beak where it, it's made to grab the clinical crown. So 151A or 151 is of course made uh, to extract mandibular incisors, canines and premolars, and of course root tips. Now, uh, let me just break here for a second. Um, Rebecca, could I break out of the um, um, PowerPoint and, and go into a live demonstration? Absolutely. Go ahead and unshare. Okay. I exit and unshare. There you go. Okay. I'm going to exit and I'm going to stop share. Yep. Okay. There you are. All right. I want to just talk about a little about the ergonomics of, of these forceps. So I brought some along with me. I'm at home here. So I don't know if you can see this, but this is a 151 forcep in my right hand, which would be to your left maybe. And then this is the 150 forcep. You can tell that both of these forceps, the handles are convex and they're made to have a, uh, your hand with an overhand grip. That also goes for the 150 forcep. You wanna use it with an overhand grip. You don't wanna go underhand and by doing underhand grips from time to time, day to day, week after week, it puts a lot of stress on your wrist. 
And believe me, you'll be doing carpal tunnel surgery after 10, 15 years of doing surgery, of oral surgery. You'll be doing, you'll have carpal tunnel surgery done. So please keep that in mind that the best uh, ergonomic for, uh, grip for these forceps is overhand. Yes, there are times when I have to go underhand, but these forceps are made convex curvature so you can put your hand on an overhand grip. All right, I'm going to go back now into the PowerPoint and I'm going to go to share and an application and then this and then present. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead with the 151 force up. I talked about that. Uh, it's more of a um, oval shaped beaks to go right on top of the clinical crown, unlike the 151A. Okay, and then here's the 150 uh, forcep made for maxillary extractions, maxillary incisors. The A stands for apical, of course. Again, for apical root tips in the maxillary arch, the beaks are more parallel. Unlike a 150 forcep, the beaks are more oval to Go, uh, fit over the clinical crown. The, you know, a lot of students call this the universal forcep, the 150 and the 151 forcep, and that's fine, but universal, in my opinion, could be used everywhere. Well, you can't use, you know, a 150 or 151 on, on molars. The only kind, time you can is when you section a molar, and we will get into that in our uh, later discussion. Dr. Ken? Dr. Ken? We lost Just you. right into that mandibular molar. And Dr. Ken, can you start yeah. over? We lost you for a second. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No problem. So the 79 forcep is my favorite forcep, and it is made for mandibular molars only. It has the beaks are pointed where it fits into the furcation on the buccal and the lingual aspect of that mandibular molar. And of course the forcep has to fit into the furcation. There are times when the furcation is not exposed. So you use a different forcep. So this forcep is only used for mandibular molars where you have for, uh, access to the furcation. It also has serrated beaks. Therefore the torque is, is extremely high, the torque is where you're going to, you're going to move that force up and you won't get any slippage. There won't be any play in that force up, unlike a 151 force up, which is that bicuspid force up we talked about earlier. It's not serrated, so you may get some play. It may slip. Unlike this force up, it, it's serrated. It has like teeth on that force up that grip onto the tooth. Also, if you notice, it's a low profile force up. It's not very tall, so it fits in the posterior area and the patient doesn't have to open very, very wide. It can, they can close halfway and that forceps still is appropriate. Okay, a 222 forcep. Um, when your furcation is not exposed, and like we talked about, when you can't use a 79, your alternative would be a 222. This is made for fused mandibular molar roots where you don't have access for cation. Your analog to this would be your 210 forcep for maxillary molars that are also fused roots. We'll get into that in a minute. But again, this forcep is great. This is great for mandibular third molars because those molars, you know, you don't have a lot of uh, diverted roots there. They're, they're typically fused. This forcep works wonderful for mandibular third molars. Wonderful. Okay, the number 23 forcep. Everybody underestimates this forcep, but it's, it's phenomenal. It's the only forcep 
that I know in existence that doesn't grab the tooth. It engages the furcation and it fulcrums off of the, fulc the furcation and evolves the tooth vertically just from leverage. It's whoever invented this, I, I would love to meet the person. Just a fabulous thought behind this forcep. Who would think that we can take out a tooth by just engaging the furcation? So again, this forcep, you have to have furco access. The furcation has to be exposed, meaning diverted roots, either parallel or diverted. And the points of these, this, this, these beaks fit right into the lingual and buccal furcation. And then you squeeze as hard as you can and the tooth moves vertically up. It evolves in an upward direction. Just a phenomenal forcep. And it's, 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 it's really underappreciated and um, it's just a good forcep. Okay, the 210 forcep. As we talked about a couple minutes ago, this is used on maxillary molars where you have fused roots. Unlike the 88R or the 88L that you can gain the furcation, you have furcation access. This is a forcep where you have fused roots on maxillary molars analogous to the 222 forcep for the mandibular molars that have fused roots. So the 210 for the maxillary fused, the 222 is for the mandibular fused roots. I know it, it could be confusing all these numbers, but you know, it, there's, it, it's, once you get accustomed to start doing more and more surgery, it becomes second nature. 210, 222, always used for fused roots. And at my next break, and when I, when I end this component, I'm gonna talk about why this forcep has these right angled bends to them. I'll, I'll, but I don't wanna break out of the PowerPoint now. So just be patient, everybody. Okay, 88R and an 88L. R is right, the L is left. This forcep is only used when you have furcation access to the maxillary molars. Um, the furcation on the buckle and then the palatal, uh, the beaks are gripped right along that palatal root and you go ahead and, uh, and, and perform your extraction. The contralateral would be the 88L. L stands for left and the R stands for right. Um, great forcep. This is also called the anatomical forcep. There's a semi-anatomical, which would be the 89 and 90, but I'm not a big fan of those. You know, they're good, they're fine. I just never got to like them. I instead use the fully anatomical forcep, the 88R and then the 88L. And here's the L. So the L would go for number 14 and number 15. And then, then number 16, assuming it would be fused roots, you'd use a 210. Okay, here's your 89 forcep. This is for the right side. And they went with a 90. I don't know why they didn't go 89R, 89L, but they didn't. 89 is for the right side, 90 is for the left side. They're identical. This is called your semi-anatomical. And again, I don't use this too often, but there's nothing wrong with it. I instead use the fully anatomical, the 88, the R and the L. Here's your 90. This is the semi-anatomical for the left side. Okay, here is a great forcep. Uh, one of the few forceps that you can use with the underhand grip. So the 74N and the similar looking forcep would be the 33. I, it, and that's coming up in the next slide or two. The 74N, N stands for narrow. And typically you, when you have root tips broken off or, or sitting in the ridge, the beaks on the 74N are parallel to engage the, the X, the walls or the, 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 the root which is parallel. Unlike a anterior crown, 
you would go with a 33 forcep because it has the beaks are more um, oval to grip the entire clinical crown. This 74N is also referred to as the ash or the bird beak. Here's the 33 forcep. As you see, the beaks are more oval in, in appearance and it's made to take out a tooth where the tooth's fully intact and it's not broken off at the gingiva. You would go ahead and use a 74N instead. This is used for a full uh, tooth that's not broken off, the 33. Both of them are serrated, wonderful forceps. These could also be used for bicuspids. Uh, uh, I've done that many, many times. You can use these for bicuspids, canines, and incisors, maxillary and mandibular. Go back and forth between the 74N and the 33. Again, the 33 is used for full tooth extractions. The 74N is used for root tips. Okay, a 32 forcep. Um, it's fine. I don't use this too often, but I see a lot of uh, clinicians that do. Uh, this is for root tips and, uh, and it's fine, but I like to re remove my root tips with a luxation, a luxator instead of a forcep. Uh, when you luxate a, a root tip out, you're very unlikely to crack it. Sometimes when you use a forcep, you can, you can re-crack it, then you'll have to go after a smaller piece. So again, a 32 forcep, it's fine. And, uh, and uh, it, it would be, it'd be perfect to use on root tips on a maxillary arch. Elevators versus luxators. Big, big confusion. A lot of students don't know the difference. The big, big difference is the shaft of the instrument. The cross section at the very tip of an elevator is more concave. A luxator, the cross section at the tip of the shaft is more flatter. The reason being luxators are made to engage the PDL space. A lot of students, they would use a luxator to elevate, and that's really incorrect. A luxator is flatter. They come in two or three different sizes, a two millimeter, a three millimeter, small, medium, large. I like the three millimeter. It has a black titanium shaft, and I love the torque that I get on that instrument. You put that right in, you find a purchase point in your PDL space, and you just turn that instrument a little bit and you create a little torque and that tooth, that root tip is pushed to one side and then you go to the other side and push it back to the other side and it becomes mobile and eventually a valsus. An elevator is always used on a perpendicular approach to your teeth, to the embrasure to the uh, interproximal space perpendicular. Ideally, that's what they're used for. And you may, you're trying to engage the tooth and you turn the elevator and one side of that, of that shank, one edge will catch a, a rough spot in the root and will start to elevate the root tip or the tooth. Luxators are made to approach the tooth parallel to the long axis of the tooth to engage the PDL space. Elevators are typically used to approach the extraction perpendicular into the interproximal space. Periosteal elevator, one of my favorites. I often refer to this as my sixth finger. This is a wonderful instrument. This is like your, your explorer in oral surgery, you use this. This is wonderful to envelope and lay an envelope flap. You take your tip of the instrument, which would be the right-hand side on my screen, take that tip. First, you would go in there with a scalpel and do a sulcular incision. Then you take the tip of the periosteal, engage the papilla, and just turn that instrument and the papilla just opens up. And then you go along the 
the sulcus of the tooth and just loosen up that sulcus. And now you you have a nice envelope flap laid, and you can you can you can gain more clinical grip at the osseous level with your forcep by opening up an envelope flap. So you want to open up a flap to gain like two millimeters more of tooth grip with your forcep. So now you're at the osseous level rather than above the gingival. Less likely that the tooth's going to crack. Less likely that you get a root tip fracture. So again, periosteal elevator, wonderful. Also, the other end, the paddle end, is used to, once you lay your flap, to keep your flap retracted sometimes when you're doing a section. When you're, when you're sectioning a tooth with your handpiece, you want to take that paddle and reflect the flap. Just a wonderful instrument. I love it. Okay, straight elevator. Um, basically, it's a straight instrument. And, um, and you, you use this to approach the tooth from, an in, from a perpendicular standpoint right into the embrasure to try to get some mo mobility. And uh, there's different elevators. Um, coming up is my favorite. This is, this is good, but I like the serrated version. And this will be coming up. So this is a great instrument, but they have serrated versions where the, the beaks um, at the very tip of the shank have teeth in them. And you're more likely to grab a tooth with that, with that serrated beak versus a non-serrated beak. Okay, this is my favorite elevator. It has a serrated um, tip on the shank and it has a slight curve to it. Again, it's made to approach the tooth from a per perpendicular standpoint going right into the interproximal space once you laid your flap. So you can get that beak of that shank right in, right laying on the root tip of the tooth and you can get some evulsion. Okay, another elevator. Uh, I love this one. It has the contralateral versus the one I just showed you. Again, it's serrated, wonderful. Just, uh, I love the serrated part of it. And again, they're all made to approach the tooth from a perpendicular standpoint. You know, and as you gain your skill level and you become more um, 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 seasoned in oral surgery, you can, you can, you know, bring in your elevator from an angle and sometimes even use it as a luxator, but mainly the basic building blocks of this presentation, I'm trying to promote building blocks where you can deviate later on when you graduate and then get some of your favorite you know, angles and methods and instruments. But I just wanna to present to you the basic building blocks. So again, this is a great instrument, use perpendicular fashion. Okay, a Potts elevator invented by Dr. Potts. I believe he was on, in Maryland on the East Coast. Um, this is the only elevator where you grab the tooth from the tip of the beak of that shaft. You don't really engage the tooth on the sides of that tip. You grab the tooth at the very tip and you rotate the instrument and you just create a little mobility and you try to pull the tooth down rather than pushing it to the side with mobility and, and creating evulsion. This is only used for maxillary third molars. Um, some schools won't let the students use this. This could easily fracture the tuberosity of the maxilla if you put too much torque on this instrument because you're only using it for maxillary third molars. And if you have a thin maxillary tuberosity, you can fracture that tuberosity. So this is a good instrument but it could be sometimes dangerous to use if you don't really um, uh, know the best uh, tooth to use it on. So just be careful, but please, if you have an opportunity, you know, take it, engage the, the maxillary third molar on the mesial surface and just get a feel for this instrument. 
It's, it's wonderful sometimes when you have that perfect interproximal space between 15 and 16, where this elevator fits right in there, and you, you rotate that and it pulls that maxillary third molar down, and it's just sometimes you don't even need a force up. You've got the tooth out that way. And then there's a right and a left. So one's used for number one, one used for number 16. This is number one. Here's number 16, just the opposite direction. Okay, a root tip pick elevator. Uh, probably my favorites. Um, this is used for primary larger root tips. The handle of this instrument mimics an elevator, like a straight elevator. And it's large at one end to grip. And then it has this small beak mainly used to take out large root tips. The double-ended pick elevator that I initially had on like the first or second slide into this component was a double-ended pick. It's used for very small root tips. This is used for larger root tips, like root tips that break off at the osseous level. You can find a purchase point and start working that root tip using this elevator. Okay, this is the other side. There's a right and a left or east and a west, some students call it. Okay. Okay, this is the other luxator. This is the more narrow, the two millimeter luxator. Um, I like the three millimeter. This is the two. This is, I've used this many, many times. Sometimes you have a purchase point that's not fitting the three millimeter. So you'd go with a two millimeter. This is made um, primary to engage the tooth at the parallel to the long axis of the tooth and to fit into the PDL space. Hopefully you won't be used as an elevator. This is made to fit into the PDL space. Okay, uh, this is the three millimeter luxator. Again, again, one of my favorites, it, it, the wider it is, it gives you more torque. Okay, so now I will exit out of this PowerPoint and hopefully there'll be a couple of questions I can answer. And Rebecca, are we okay? Absolutely. Okay, I will exit out and okay, any questions? Please. Perfect. All right, Dr. Ken, we have one question that popped up while you were presenting. Folks, if you have any questions um, regarding any of the instruments Dr. Ken has shared with us today, please shoot them in the Q&A box to, um, below and he can answer those for you guys. And we'll, we'll just take about five minutes to answer some questions and then we'll move on to the next um, component. Awesome. Okay, so the first question was, why move, what movement should be used with number 79 forceps on mandibular molar? Okay, great question. I'd love to do another presentation on how to take teeth out, but this is just basically for the armamentarium, but, but let's get into that. I love the question and I, my students that I work with at the, at the university, they can answer this for you. I would like to Initially, when you take that forcep on, on a lower mandibular molar, you want to use a rotationary for a, a pattern in the same plane. The reason being, even though it's a multi-rooted tooth, you want to take those two roots of that tooth and rotate that tooth with the 79 to expand the sockets of, of the mesial and the distal socket of that mandibular molar. You just want to put pressure on those walls of that socket where you're going to compress the bone and then you go to the other side with that with that rotation and you'll compress the bone on the other side you do that about and you hold those those patterns so you take the rotation with the forcep and you go maybe 10 degrees out of a, out of 360 and you get a little little mo movement and you hold that position and the sharpies fibers are breaking and the bones being condensed then you take that forcep and you rotate the tooth to the other direction and hold it for maybe 10 seconds. You'll get some sharpies fibers breaking and then some bone being condensed. And you do that for 10, 15 times in a row and the tooth become more mobile. Then as you create some 
mo mobility, you take that forcep and you turn the tooth out to the buckle. And hopefully it'll come out to the buckle. Most molars, most molars, instead of coming out vertically, they come out to the buckle. Maxillary molars, mandibular molars. But initially, I love to always, on all my molars, I use a rotationary pattern to initiate my extraction, to create a mobile tooth, and then you go to the buckle aspect with the forcep. Does that answer anything? That was perfect, Dr. Khan. Okay. It looks like there's a follow-up question. It's, what is your opinion of physics forceps, limitations and use? Um, I honestly, um, I heard they're good. I've never used one. Uh, now, again, that physics forcep, it goes along to the same concept of the number 23 forcep. So you're, you're using bone as your, as your leverage and your avulsion of tooth. But honestly, I really can't comment on it. I've never used one. I'm so old school, it's pathetic. I, I just, um, I stick to my basics and uh, I'm a very simplistic kind of clinician. I don't go for all those new inventions. So I'm sorry about that one. I don't have too much information. Okay, moving on. If you had limited options, what would be your top must haves? Which would be my top must have? Yep. Okay, well, um, boy, that's a toughie. Um, okay, luxators are a must have. Um, uh, number 151, 150 forcep are a must have because you can use those for bicuspids, canines, and incisors. And as far as uh, a maxillary molar, uh, an 88 and an L and an R. And, uh, and you know, when you section a maxillary molar, which we're gonna get, get into later on in the presentation, you can convert the forcep into a 150 forcep because we're converting a multi-rooted tooth into three separate extractions because we're sectioning the roots. But an 88 L and an R would be a must have. And then I would say a, uh, a 222 forcep on the lower perfused roots on mandibular molars. Because a awesome. 222, you can always use that for, a few, for diverted roots. It just won't engage into the furcation, but it does engage the clinical crown. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Um, if a mandibular third molar has a distilled tilted root, what is your advice for extraction? Okay, great question. Um, so I'm assuming that the root, the, the tooth drifted toward the distal of the second mandibular molar. I'm taking that into assumption. That's what you mean. I would cut off the mesial half of that clinical crown and the mandibular molar. That would allow me to get a elevator underneath the clinical crown of, of uh, 17 or 32 and it would give me a little clearance to elevate that up above the second lower molar. Again, I don't know if this is partially impacted, but even if it's partially impacted, you can take a 702 burr on a straight surgical handpiece and do a bony roof trough over that mandibular molar, cut off the mesial half, that's bedded, that's up against the second molar, get some clearance and elevate the tooth out that way. Wonderful. Okay. Luxers, what brand do you recommend are the best ones? One more time, sorry. The Luxers, what brand oh. do you recommend are the best ones? Um, you know, I, I don't care. I'm not gonna try to promote any brands here. Uh, I just like the three millimeter and the two, uh, uh, the small and the large, the two and the three. And I prefer the three because it, it really creates a lot of torque. Uh, the wider the beak of the shaft into the PDL space, the less likely you will ever fracture a root tip. And you're just hugging the entire root surface and you're putting force on it. It's just sometimes you can get out a tooth or a root tip only by using a three millimeter luxator. Okay. 
Do you have any love for the crier elevators? <laughs> um, I don't. Uh, they're very pointy. My my take on that uh, elevator is, again, a lot of schools use them, and and I know I know students are exposed to them. They're too pointy, and when you have a pointy root tip on the shaft or on the on the beak, all that exertion of that force is focused on one point of the root or the tooth or whatever you're trying to get out there. And you can over exert force and you can crack pieces off. I like to have my force more um, uh, diffused along the whole surface of the tooth, not just one point. So I'm not a big fan of the crier. Okay. Um, we have two more questions, guys. We're gonna wrap it up and we're gonna move on. So. This, uh, this question, or well, actually it's an opinion. I feel the ones with plastic or rubber handles better than the metal handles for the Luxators. Do you have uh, I'm sorry, I've never saw of the plastic handled ones. I know they're out there. I don't know, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, I, we're, I, we don't use them at our university and uh, I do not believe Aspen either uses them. They use all metal and titanium shafts. Okay, and then last question is, what about periotomes? Periotomes are great. They're, they're wonderful. Um, it's very similar to a luxator. Um, uh, I've used periotomes, you know, occasionally. Uh, they're very, very sharp, and you have to be very cautious when you use them because um, you could do some damage if you slip, and it's extremely sharp. It's like using a scalpel. So they're fine. Um, I just gotten to like the Luxators instead. Okay, wonderful. You have a couple shout outs, Dr. Ken, and then we'll move on. Um, Amy from Midwestern says hi. Amy okay. Taylor. Um, and then we also have Forrest Quick says hi too. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, hi back. Thank you everybody right. for attending. Okay. Okay, I'm wonderful. Going Let's to move on to your next one. All right. Great questions, guys. And again, if you have questions while Dr. Ken is presenting, you can shoot them in the Q and A box, and then I'll save them for the end of the um, of the end, the end of the section. Okay. Okay. So now here's a fun little exercise. Um, I I made this last year, and it's been a hit. All my students at the university love it. So here's a tooth number fourteen fifteen. And the, the question is choose the right forcep. Uh, the next slide will give you the answer. So I'll give um, a couple seconds to look at the x-ray. I'm gonna just highlight what should be noted here. I'm gonna highlight what should be noted. Number 14, the buccal roots are diverted. So they're the furcation that's available and to be accessed. Number 15, the furcation is not um, access not exposed. In my opinion, we can consider that a fused root. So 14, the furcation is, is available. Number 15, it's not. So that being said, I'll go to the answer and here it is. 14 and 88L, if it's a left molar, 15 a 210 force up. Okay, number 1819. Um, I'll highlight some of the high points that you should keep in mind to answer the question. Number 19, as you see, the, the roots are parallel. The furcation, once you lay that envelope flap, it could be accessed. Unlike number 18, the furcation is not as prevalent. It's not as um, um, uh, prominent. The roots are, are parallel. Maybe you can, they're starting to close up and become fused. Number 19, they're more parallel, definite interproximal bone. So once you lay an envelope flap to expose the furcations on number 19, you can use the force up of a, 70, of a 23 or a 79 and number 19. If you could get into the force up a 19, 
and you can squeeze that forcep, you'd use a 23. But if you take that 23 forcep, number 19, and it doesn't make any, you know, you can't squeeze it, it won't go into that interproximal bone, put it down, then take your 79 forcep. Do a little rotationary turning in the same plane. If you deviate out of that plane, that's when the root tips are going to crack because there's no mobility yet. So you have to take that force up in the same plane, get a little mobility, then either tip it, start tipping it buckly, or you may even have to section it. We'll get into that later on. So number 18, because the furcation is not as prominent, because the roots are a little bit fused, you may be able to use a 79 forcep. And if not, you use a 222. And consider that too to be a fused root. Okay, number three. So as you see, number three, there's no access to your furcation. So your forcep of choice would be a 210. Now, if there was, if that, you know, if those buckle roots were diverted, you'd use an 88R. Okay, on number 29 and number 30. So we'll start off with 29. This is a, just a, a must flap situation. You have to lay your envelope flap because if you don't, you take a force up to this tooth and you engage it a little bit above that decayed area, the clinical crown will snap off. This is a must. Lay your envelope flap and maybe even a little vertical release component to it. So your envelope flap with maybe a, a small vertical release. You know, oral surgery, oral surgery tissue is very resilient. You do your, your vertical, uh, you do your envelope flap with a vertical release you suture it all closed afterward, a week later, it looks great. So don't be afraid to lay a flap. I tell my students all the time, you have to learn how to manage tissue. Lay your flap to get, your, to get the most grip on the tooth with the forcep. So again, number 29, you lay your flap and, you're, and then before I go to the answer, let's talk about number 30. Number 30, you lay your flap. Now that furcation is sitting low. It's not as high up in the bone. You may not be able to access that furcation. And there, I don't see any, any radiolucency bone there. So it's pretty rock solid. So maybe the force up, maybe a 79 wouldn't work on this lower molar. So you're, you're probably, it could work, but maybe not. So I'll go to the answers and on number 30, a 79, which possible, depending on, that, on, the, on the level of that furcation, but for sure a number 222 will do it because you would treat that as a fused root because you can't get to your furcation. Number 29, the first uh, forcep of choice would be what everybody calls a universal, your 151, not 151A, your 151. But again, lay your flap, please lay your flap. You'll, 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 you'll regret it later on. You break off this root tip and this root is embedded in bone. And this could be an, a good half hour of, of clinical time, maybe even an hour. Your patients are all backed up. You know, you got patients waiting in the waiting room because you didn't lay your proper flap and it cracked off your clinical crown. So, and if you're 151, if you don't like that, maybe because some slippage, some play, you don't have that torque like you would, then you go with a 33. And that 33 goes over the clinical crown and tries to engage the tooth below the decayed area to get some rotationary movement. You don't want to use a 74N here because the beaks are very parallel. It wouldn't grip that clinical crown properly. A 33 would. Okay, number 31, that's the, the, the distal tooth. Number 30 is the one attached to that bridge. So number 31, um, 
This could be, again, there's a lot of bone loss here. So could be a, a, a quite a few uh, choices here. My first choice would be maybe a 222, if you could. Engage the force up, maybe a 79. Let's see what I wrote down, a 222 or 79. And this is gonna be such an easy extraction. You can even maybe lay your flap and take an elevator from the interproximal, come in on a perpendicular fashion and uh, elevate this out from the mesial. Really, really, this would be an easy extraction. Okay, on number two and number three. So number two, I'll highlight what I want you to look at. It's, I'm assuming this is a fused root. The buccal roots are fused. So hint, hint, right away, it would be a 210 instead of an 88R. Number three, parallel roots with a definite furcation. Once you lay your flap, you can tell, you can, you can get access to that furcation because it's right at the osseous level. You'd use an 88R. Okay, next slide. Number 14 and number 15. So number 14, uh, I think you can get furcation access, furcal access. The roots are parallel. Number 15, the roots are fused. So number 14, right away, the anatomical forcep, which would be your 88L. You lay, again, you have to lay a flap. A flap is a must, at least an envelope flap. You have to gain access to, your, to that furcation. And then on number 15, a 210, which is similar to your 222 for your mandibular molars, but in this case, it's maxillary molars. These roots are fused. You take a 210 and you rotate this tooth out, it'll come right out. You may wanna take a perpendicular elevator from the interproximal, from the buccal, and just get a little mobility and then take your 210 force up and with some rotationary movement, this is gonna come out to the distal in a buckle approach, distal buckle, this will come out. You can see on the x-ray, the bone's not as condensed. So this will get compacted when you're rotating this tooth and it'll come right out and you won't break your tuberosity. Okay, so there's your answers. Okay, here's a bunch of root tips, 23, 24, 25, 26. So again, uh, you, you, you probably know what I'm gonna say, lay your flap. And you know, as you get quick and, and seasoned and, and comfortable, you can lay a flap in 30 to 60 seconds. Take a scalpel, run it along the sulcus, take your periosteal elevator, open up that tissue, and you're done. And that, I mean, even sometimes 30 seconds, you can lay a flap along all those teeth. That's how quick you can get. So um, I would probably start off and take out number 25 with a, with a, a, a 70, with a 33 force up, rotate that out. And then you take an elevator between 27 and 26 and elevate the root tip to the mesial and that will come right out. And then you take out 23 and 24, push it mesially as well and they'll come right out. Um, uh, if you don't wanna do that, you can luxate all four of those teeth and they'll become mobile. And then you can repeat what I just talked about with the elevator or the force up and it'll come right out. A 74 N force up would be used for the root tip. A 33 force up would be used for your, uh, the 24, uh, 23, four and five teeth. 
would be a 33 forcep. And for number 26 root tip, you'd use a 74N. And again, I have as an answer, Luxator elevator, a 74 and a 33. Okay, tooth number four. Now, again, you're looking at it, it's endotreated. Therefore, it's brittle. It can crack. You probably don't want to go right off the get. Dr. Ken, we lost you. And you may have to um, remove some circular occlusal tissue, but first find it. It'll be an easy find. You know, it's right mesial to number three, and it's right in the center of the ridge. And then you take your luxator, get some, um, uh, get it to move, and then take a 150 force up, and it'll come right out. Or you can elevate it out with, a, with an elevator. So I have the answer being a luxator, but um, that could maybe that could be your first and only instrument to get that tooth out. It'll it'll easily come out. Okay, number thirty. Uh, not an easy extraction. Why do I say that? Because all those roots are embedded in bone. The bone is pretty dense. You don't have really a furcation exposure. So the furcation is not accessible. So this is a hard extraction. The mesial root is a little curved more than a distal. They're, they're parallel, but there, there's a lot of septal bone there. The more septal bone, the harder the extraction. The more septal bone, the harder the extraction. So I would again lay a small flap. Uh, you could go ahead with a 79 maybe even a 23, if it could get into the frication, I doubt it, but a 79 should do it. And then you do a little rotationary. And then after 10 or 15 twistings in the same plane, then you take it out to the buckle. Let's see what I have, 79 or 23. Now, I'm gonna go off on a tangent. You know, again, if, if the 79 is not working and you're, you're rotating it and it's just not giving and you're afraid to go out to the buckle, you're gonna crack a root, then we have to section it. And I'm gonna go into that in the, the next 30 minutes here, just hang on. Okay, number 32 extraction. Um, the furcation setting way below the osseous level the roots are somewhat parallel, if not fused. I would probably go with a 222. You would rotate this tooth again in a rotationary pattern in the same plane. And you get some enough rotation, it'll come out to the buckle. Okay. All right, number 17, 18, and 19. This is coming to an end. So I'm almost done with this component. So bear with me, please. So number 17, as you see, fused roots right away, 222 forcep. And or start off with an elevator, go into the interproximal and then do some elevation, then go with a 222, it'll rotate right out. And here's an extraction where the patient goes to an oral surgeon and, and they'll have to pay four or $500 for this extraction. You can do it in your office. If you're seasoned, skilled, and you're getting comfortable, it should only take you max five minutes to get this tooth out. Profound anesthesia, a good IA block, lay a small flap, a little elevation, a 222 force up, it'll come right out. All right, number 18. Again, uh, this is a little complicated now. I threw this in there because I, I wanna maybe phase into the sectioning mode in a minute. But um, if you could get into the furcation, I doubt it, 
would a, would a 79 force up or, or a 23. Um, but if you can, maybe a little um, 79 action where you'd start to rotate this, you have the important aspect here, you have to get below apical to this decay. If, you, if you're grabbing this at the decayed area, it will just crack off this clinical crown. You have to get apical with your forcep to this decay and engage the tooth or the clinical crown below the decayed area and maybe into the furcation. Uh, Number 19, again, you could see all that decay. I would really, I would section this tooth, but before we get into that, you maybe take a, a, a 23 force up, gain the furcation, and maybe it can evolve a little bit before it cracks off, but I would bet you'd have to, this is gonna crack, you'd have to take a luxator and, and uh, work each root gently because it's endotreated. If you exhi exhibit too much force with your luxator, you'll crack that again, because again, it's endotreated and it's curved. So let's see what I have here. 17, number 17, 222 fused roots. Number 18, a 79, because maybe we could get into that furcation. And number 19, a 23, and then you would section and use a luxator and an elevator. Okay, again, very easy extraction. Some clinicians out there, you know, who, who are not comfortable would refer this out to an oral surgeon. This is a gimme. You lay a flap, take a luxator, and it would just, in a matter of a couple minutes, this will come right up, number 25. Now, say you wanna remove number 20, Two, you'd take an elevator on the mesial of that tooth, get a purchase point and elevate it up vertically and it'll come right up. Okay, I think this is coming to the end, number eight, nine, and 10. Again, um, I consider this fun extractions. They're, they're covered by tissue. So first of all, you'd have to find the root tips and you'd make a, a ridge incision right on top of the ridge and take your periosteal elevator, open up that, that ridge incision, hopefully finding the orifices of the root tip or the occlusal or the root tip surface. And then once you find the root tips, you would go ahead and, and create more of an envelope flap, maybe by removing some tissue but envelope the buckle, envelope the lingual, and then luxate, luxate, luxate. These teeth will come out in a matter of minutes. Luxate, luxate, with a three millimeter luxator, you, you, any mesial distal, it'll come right up. And there's your answer, luxate. Okay, so that is the end of this component. I will uh, now, Rebecca, I'm going to exit out. Perfect. We have some questions for you, Doc. Okay. I will exit out and stop here. You could tell I'm old school. <laughs> You're okay. doing wonderful. Okay. So we have a few questions. How to prevent fractures of, of tooth roots number four or five? Great question. So obviously number five is double, it, you know, it's always di uh, diverted, number five, they're at the first buy. Um, all right, here's what I tell my students. And I couldn't, I couldn't harp on this more. You, you envelope your flap, you take your 154 step, and you start rotating this tooth, buckle and lingual in the same plane. By doing that, you're gonna get some mobility at the very tip of those root tips the very tip. So now if you can see my fingers, by rotating it, you're turning this and you'll get some, you know, these will become a little bit mobile and will disconnect from the PDL fibers, from the Sharpies fibers. Maybe they're ankylos a little bit, it'll disconnect. So do that 15 times, just ro ro it, uh, rotate and hold. Go to the lingual, rotate and hold. Then as you get a little mobility, start to go to the buckle and see if it wants to go. You know, the tooth's gonna tell you which way it wants to come out. 
If it's stubborn, it doesn't want to go to the buckle, then you have to create more rotationary mobility. Eventually, it'll go to the buckle. But let's say it doesn't. Then you are going to section that root. And again, I don't really section by, by cuspids too often because rarely will you have to, but have I? Absolutely. And it was stubborn and it wouldn't come to the buckle. And if I exhi exhibited too much buckle force, I know I'd crack the root tip. So please start off with some rotation. Wonderful. Okay. Do you prefer to split the roots into manageable single roots in most scenarios for divergent maxillary and mandibular molars? Love the question. I'm going to get into, hold off on that question. I'm going to get into that in component, in the next component. Love it. I love sectioning teeth, so I, I'll talk all about it. Okay, great. How do we read the maxillary molars palatal roots if they are in the sinus and if it's safe afterwards? So I'm assuming if, if, it, if you push the root tip in the sinus, is that, is that what the question is? Uh, how do I, can you repeat it one more time? How do we read the maxillary molars palatal roots if they are in the sinus and okay. it's safe afterwards? Okay, I understand. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so when you look at the x-ray, look at your PDL. So, uh, I mean, look at your periapical. I'm sorry, I gave, gave away the answer. Look at the periapical. Now, a periapical x-ray, you know, there are so many students they come up to Dr. K, Dr. K, can we take this out on the floor instead of taking it down to oral surgery? And they show me a bite wing. And I say, what, what are you showing me? Show me the periapical. I need to see the root con uh, configuration. Oh, okay. So then they show me a PA. So now go ahead and look at the PA. If I see that, that palatal root with a PDL around it, then I know it's not in the sinus. If a PDL is around it, it's not in the sinus. The sinus may be encroaching the interceptal bone around it, that root concavity, but the root itself is really in bone if you have a PDL around it. Okay. Is raising a flap necessary when it can be done without it? Uh, I, I know a lot of students are, are somewhat reluctant to, to um, create flaps. Um, I was talking to an oral surgeon a long time ago and his, uh, his take on this was, if I can't see the bone, Dr. K, I'm not going to take the tooth out. So he likes to get that extra two millimeters of of um, forcep grip, meaning the biological width we're talking about. I hope everybody's on board with all that now. So if I can lay a flap and I, I gained another two millimeters of forcep grip, meaning the, the forceps lying on the bone, it is a great advantage. So in my opinion, I would say 90% of my extractions or let me be conservative, 75% are flap related. Okay, last question. Would you create a through around a fractured premolar to help with luxation and elevation? You said groove? Um, trough? Yeah, okay, so bony trough, yeah. Okay, so here's my take on that. Um, I love a 702 surgical burr. And if I do create a bony trough, obviously you don't want to create a bony trough adjacent to the next tooth because that's, you know, assuming we're saving that tooth, you want to get that bony trough riding the surface of the tooth you're taking out. So get that burr and hug the surface of the root that you're removing. And the reason why we want to do a trough is because we can't find a purchase point with the luxator in the PDL space. We, we've searched high and low. We went around the whole uh, PDL, uh, the whole root tip, and we can't find a good purchase point to engage with the luxator. Then you make a purchase point. So there are, yes, there are many, many times I'll take a burr, but I'll try to hug the root. I just won't enter, I just won't, uh, um, uh, spontaneously remove some interproximal bone and then take the, I'll, I'll make sure it's hugging the root surface. 
Wonderful. All right, let's move on. Any other questions, guys? We'll get to them in the next uh, in the next component. Okay. You're doing great, Dr. Ken. All right, well, good. Thank you. Okay. All right, sectioning. All right, um, again, so many clinicians would never even attempt this. Everybody's scared. You're really being conservative. You're, you're using caution. When you have a multi-rooted tooth and it's rock solid and you, you, know, you have a little mobility but nothing to brag about, your next, your next plan B would be to suction. If you exert force using plan A, you're gonna crack the root tips and some of those root tips are gonna crack at the apical third of the root. And you know how hard it is to get out a root tip when it's that far up into the bone? Difficult, difficult, difficult. So my take on sectioning is you're creating single tooth extractions from a multi-rooted tooth. And I'm going to go into the patterns on the next slide. And, um, you know, it's used when you have severe decay and when you have difficult, difficulty placing your forceps, when you have high bone level and, um, and uh, sectioning converts a three rooted tooth into single root extractions. They pay very close to the location of furcation. The, uh, uh, bullet point number four, uh, memorize that and, and, and just put it into your mind. Pay very close to the attention to the furcation. I'll show you some examples of sectioning went, went bad. And again, the burr of choice, a 702 versus 702, a 701 is a much thinner uh, shank and the 702 is a little wider. I'm a little bit more aggressive with my sectioning. I like to use a 702 versus 701, but they're basically the same length. They're the same uh, flutes. They're just thicker in circumferential nature. All right, so now we're gonna get into the pattern of sectioning. All right, I actually drew these. And um, when I first started teaching back in 2011, and um, here's a, the top photo is where you're gonna make your Y pattern. Some students call it a Mercedes pattern. And um, so you always wanna find your furcation. If you can't find your frication, don't section a tooth because if you section a tooth without finding your frication, you could be sectioning within one of the buccal roots. Then it's only gonna exacerbate your problem and make it much more difficult to get this tooth out. So I start off sectioning by literally going in from a perpendicular, and I don't want to confuse everybody, but I'm going to throw this in there. I like to lay my flap, then I take my 702, and I cut off the clinical crown. I cut it off. Now, when I graduated dental school, you know, 30 years ago, if that, someone would have told me cut off the clinical, I would have said, you're crazy. I need that, to, you know, for grip. Crazy, no way. But believe me, cut off the clinical crown, at least three quarters of it. By doing that, you're, you're shortening your target of hitting your furcation when you do suction. So you, you take a burr from the buckle and you just make a horizontal cut, cut off the clinical crown. Then you take your burr parallel to the line, long axis of the tooth, sitting in the furcation, and you go halfway into the occlusal tab table, and then you make your Y section to avoid the palatal root. Okay, the bottom um, diagram. This diagram is used when you have buccal roots on your maxillary mowers that are fused because of, now think about it. If we're trying to section the buccal roots and they're fused, impossible. Not going to happen. It's only going to create, if you're going to cut off a tip of the root and, and the entire root fusure is still intact, it's only going to create more difficulty. 
So your bottom diagram, you're sectioning, instead of your Y pattern, you're sectioning from mesial to distal. You are taking your buccal roots as one root, you're treating it, and you're separating it from your palatal root. Then you take your luxator after you made your section, and you very, very lightly start turning a luxator to create those two pieces to move independently. They have to move independently. If you stick your luxator in your cut and you turn it and you and the toe tooth moves at one, then the roots are not sectioned. You have to go back there with your burr and go deeper into your inter into your um, uh, interproximal bone. Again, the top diagram, you're gonna make your Y pattern and you're, you're sectioning your buccal roots from one another and your palatal root. And then you take a luxator or even an elevator, any instrument to try to get into that cut that you just made and turn it ever so slightly from a vertical approach and see if the roots are moving independently from one another. Once you get some movement, you'll start elevating each root tip individually or luxating each root tip individually. Again, I don't want to get into the, um, the method of extracting teeth because there's only so much I can talk about tonight before I, everybody gets exhausted. So um, this is just your maxillary molar sectioning. Now let's go to the mandibular. So again, pretty uniform, pretty, there's only one, one type of section here, it's buccal lingual. You're, you're sectioning your buccal roots because they're diverted or parallel. If the roots are fused, please don't even attempt a section. You'll get yourself into trouble. If they're fused, the tooth's gotta be rotated when it comes out, not sectioned maybe you'd have to make a little bony trough along one side of those fused roots to gain access with your furcation, with your luxator, I'm sorry, with your luxator or your elevator. Okay, so this is your mandibular molar. All right. All right, here's a case happened several years ago. I was called to help out in another suite um, they didn't find their furcation and they sectioned this. As you see, they sectioned the mesial root now into two. So they took an x-ray afterward. And uh, this is what I'm talking about. You have to find your furcation. And here's a point I didn't mention earlier. You have to imagine the angulation of your tooth and you have to do a little guessing. So when you take your, your burr, your 702 or your 701, you place it into the furcation, you have to just kind of um, uh, lay your burr parallel to the long axis of the tooth. So if it's drifted a little measly, you have to take that into consideration when you do your sectioning. Maybe that wasn't done here. Plus the furcation wasn't found. So, Again, um, as you get comfortable with sectioning, lay your flap, find your frication, look at the x-ray again, and memorize the angulation of it. Try to mimic it with your burr in the mouth and go ahead and section. Okay, so that is that for sectioning. I'm going to exit out. Okay. All right, Dr. Ken, we have a few questions that came in towards the end of last component. Um, we have in general, are flaps placed distributely when working the posterior and how far to extend? I think there's, he might've typed that out really quick. Um, that makes sense? Can you re Rebecca, repeat that one more time. I'm not sure if there's some misspellings in here. In general, are flaps placed distributely, I don't know if that's a word, when working the posterior and how far to extend. Okay, 
All right. I, I, I think I, I know. Okay. So let me just talk about how far to extend a flap. I like to, so if the, if the, if the sextant of the teeth, if you have a full sextant of teeth, a full quadrant of teeth, and you want to take out number uh, 29, you want to start your flap in the sulcus of number 28 in the center of the buccal surface. And you want to go into the interproximal of 28 and 29, come out of 20, the interproximal and go into the 29 sulcus and turn the scalpel into the interproximal of 29 and 30, and then come out to the interproximal of 30 and go along the buccal surface halfway. So again, I'll, I'll repeat it. Halfway on the buccal surface of the mesial adjacent tooth and halfway on the buccal surface of the distal adjacent tooth. Now, if you don't have a number 30 and you wanna remove number 29, you have an edentuous ridge, um, um, a free end, we call it, an edentuous ridge. You want to take your scalpel and finish the sulcular incision on number 29 on distal, and you want to just go a straight inc inc incision on the top of the ridge, about maybe a half of a tooth long, and then take your periosteal elevator and open up that tissue. So again, about a half of a tooth long, but this would be a straight uh, ridge incision, distal to 29, when you don't have a number 30. Awesome. Okay. Is there any areas around any tooth we have to be careful of important structures while drilling or sectioning or um, troughing? Well, sure. You know, of course, when you... Um, when you have uh, uh, the lower bicuspid, you don't wanna do a big vertical release around the mental foramen. You wanna keep that into consideration. You know, you look at your x-rays. So you, you angle your vertical release, if you're gonna do that on that envelope flap, away from your mental foramen. So that's one consideration. Um, um, you know, of course you're drawing, you know, mandibular bone, you're doing maxillary bone. There's, there's always considerations, but read your x-ray, study your x-ray. Sometimes when I go to Aspen and I, um, for the beginning of the day, and I look at all my extractions and I'll, I, a difficult one, I'll look at the x-ray and I'll read it, I'll memorize it. Then I'll go to my first or second patient and that patient is going to come in, in the afternoon, but then I'll go back to that x-ray and just read it again and just memorize it and just get a game plan, get a plan A, get a plan B. So if the luxation fails, and I do have to trough bone, do I want to trough on the mesial of the root, on the distal of the root? I really want to trough on the buccal. I really want to trough on the lingual. If I had to choose between buccal and lingual, I'll trough on the lingual. But uh, the last part of, of, a, of a molar would be on the, our premolar as well, would be on the buckle. In, in, in this case, all teeth would be on the buckle. I don't want to trough on the buckle because the buckle bone will, will predict your ridge height. Your buckle bone predicts your ridge height. So if you start removing buckle bone, you have no shortened and lowered your, your uh, alveolar ridge. Great, the last question here, um, Dr. Ken, and then we'll move on. Oh, well, two questions. <laughs> every situation, in every situation, is it advisable to trough the lingual palatal bone? I know typically we trough vocal bone. Okay, great question. So let's just say that we took out the buccal roots on number 14 and the, the powder root is stubborn and you're just, you know, you're sweating and you're now you're thinking, oh my God. So you, you, you make a decision. Do we have septal bones still around the powder root? So if you have an airless handpiece, a surgical handpiece, you can go ahead and remove all that septal bone along that powder root that's interproximally. Um, if you still need to get a purchase point. And I would do a little bony trough on the lingual plate to take a luxator into that purchase point and then turn it and push that palatal root 
into the space that you just made by removing interceptal bone. So if that made any sense, I'll, I'll say it real quick one more time. Remove interceptal bone around that powder root with an air, airless handpiece because you don't want to create a, 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 a air in that, in that other socket to the buckle to create um, air pockets. So then you want to take your same drill, same handpiece. And by the way, those 702s and that when you drill through bone, they dull real quickly. So you may want to change them. Take a little trough on the lingual plate to get a purchase point to stick your luxator or your elevator into to move that powder root into the space of the interproximal. Okay, so it looks like he said at UIC, they trough focal bone more often than lingual due to vascular structures. Well, um, you know, I, I try not to trough buckle or lingual. I don't like to trough buckle bone. Uh, there's clinicians who do that, um, but I like to preserve my buckle bone and I like to, the worst scenario, if I have to trough, it would be a lingual plate and uh, just maybe two or three um, mil millimeters deep, not very, very deep, just to get a purchase point. So I try to stay away from buckle bone, but I, I've seen it done. Have I troughed, uh, have I troughed buckle bone? Absolutely, practicing 30 years. I've done it all. But um, if that's my last choice. Okay. Doesn't buckle bone troughs cause aesthetic issues? Yes, absolutely. That's what I'm talking about. It'll, it'll lower the, the uh, ridge height. And uh, if you're doing a bridge, then your pontic is going to be elongated and longer looking than the abutment teeth. Or if you're doing a partial, um, you know, you'll have less retention. Um, it, again, it, if you're only removing a little buckle bone, it's not going to matter a great deal. But if you remove a lot of buckle bone, then your retention has lessened because you don't have much ridge anymore. Beautiful. Okay, let's move on, Ken, to, the, to your next component. Okay. You guys are asking some great questions, folks. Okay. All right, dry socket management, and then we have you know, oral antral communication management, then we're done. So dry socket management. Uh, I just want everybody to understand that if this develops, don't take it personal. You didn't do nothing wrong. It, I just want to teach you how to manage this. So uh, a lot of reasons, there's a multitude of reasons why dry sockets happen, but some of the most common reasons is uh, they happen more often on mandibular bone than maxillary because there's the lamina dura is more prevalent than it is on a, on a maxillary. And um, I, a, a little bit ago, about five years ago, an oral surgeon told me, how's teaching going? I bet you get a lot of dry sockets. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he said, the longer you work on, on an extraction, and, and it, this was in his opinion, I, I don't know if it's Bible, but it made sense to me. The longer you spend on an extraction, the more pressure you, you're, you're exerting on those, on those walls, on the buckle and the lingual and mesial, and you're condensing them. The more condensation of the bone, the less vascularity comes through later on in healing. So you may have less of a clot form, therefore more exposed bone, therefore more of a dry socket. So how do we treat this? Um, first of all, I, I tell my students, I said, a uh, patient calls up and, oh, Dr. Ken, that tooth we removed two days ago, they're having pain. Um, you wanna have the patient in. And I tell the students, ask them three questions. Are they swollen? You wanna look and they're not swollen. Are they, is it pussy? Is there an exudate present? No, 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 no pus, no serous fluid. The other um, criteria, is it red and, and yellow and purple in color? No, it's pink. Therefore, if all those, those three questions, if you say no to them, then it's a dry socket. 99% of the time, it's a dry socket problem. So what you do is you uh, irrigate the socket with saline to get some food and whatever is in there out. And then you take your dry socket paste that has the eugenol in it. And I like to take those uh, big syringes 
that Henry Schein makes, those big plastic syringes, and you take some dry socket paste and you put it in that syringe and you syringe some of that eugenol right into that socket and you follow it up with a gel foam as a filler. And then you can do a couple more um, additional steps. You could take some collagen tape, put that over the gel foam and then suture that collagen tape over like a blanket over that socket. Or you could just leave the collagen tape off and just suture the two flaps of tissue that is left over from the extraction over the gel foam to keep it intact. Um, sometimes you could do a figure X, you can do individual, uh, whatever you know is, is appropriate, you can do. So that's my take on dry socket um, management. Uh, again, it's, it should only take you five minutes. Usually the, the paste will dissipate and wash away after three days. You may have to have the patient back. I use, if you have them in on a Monday, I always have them back one more day before the end of the week or the weekend. And you, and you may have to do it again. Re remember that a socket heals from within and it heals outward. So if you could get some paste along that socket wall and then you could get some tissue growth to occur, then it's, it's over. Then the patient is not at all, at all uh, symptomatic and, and it's gone. Your dry socket is gone. And now you have some tissue and some heme and it just takes sometimes three, four days for that to happen. Uh, you may have to repeat this. I've done maybe, uh, you know, in my recollection, I had to repeat a dry socket pack sometimes six, seven, eight times until we had some of that sensitive bony socket walls um, coated over with a heme or a tissue. And that dry socket paste would be the band-aid for that to happen. So um, I'm going to exit out of this. I'm gonna show you the syringe that I would use to um, put the dry socket paste in there. Okay, so here's the syringe. You take your dry socket paste, put it right at the end here with any instrument you have, you know, maybe that much and then take your plunger and put it all the way. And then go ahead and again, saline the socket out, syringe some dry socket paste into the socket and you're getting it right at the apical portion of the socket. Take your, your gel foam and go ahead and put that on top, maybe two gel foams and then maybe suture right over that socket or put a piece of collagen tape acting as a blanket and suture that after the tape is placed and you're going to just seal that up. Okay. Lovely. We have a couple of questions, Dr. Ken. After how many days after extractions do dry sockets occur? Yeah, so it takes about, that's a great question. Um, two days. Two days is your minimum. Rarely, I don't think I've ever, ever seen a dry socket happen a day later. Uh, typically two to four days mainly on mandibular molar teeth, mandibular molar teeth, especially if you're taking out mandibular third molars, uh, because why is that? Well, because that bone is dense. That's where the body of the ramus turns and that's where your bone is thick and that's where your, your, your corner, your mandible is. So in case, you know, back in the day when you fall and you're playing football and you get hit, it, your jaw doesn't break. So there's thick lamina dura there and there's less vascularity. So you're gonna get that dry socket. Okay, and what do you suggest we use for patients for pain from dry sockets? Okay, great, here's my, my magic potion. I'll tell the patient, I go, well, what we're gonna do, and then we're gonna saline. So the minute I put in my dry socket paste, I'm gonna tell the patient, this is like magic potion. I say, this is magic, and in 60 to 120 seconds, you'll get relief. They, they look at me like I'm really crazy. Sure enough, 
60 to 120 seconds to put your paste in. Now, again, it's got to be put in with your syringe at the apical portion of your socket, not at the very top. And then you put maybe, you know, you fill your socket about a quarter filled with dry socket paste, maybe a third. And then you put your, your gel foam to smoosh it all up along the walls. And I'm telling you in two minutes, they'll tell you, I feel good right now. So then that'll last for about a day. And then they may get a little couple twings of pain here and there, Advil, you know, ibuprofen, anything they want, or get them in another time a day or two later and redo the pack, redo it. By then the gel foam's resorbed, or if not, pull it out and refresh the socket with more pace and a new gel foam. Okay, lovely. All right, Dr. Ken, um, we have one component left, correct? Yes. yes. Wonderful. Let's get uh, let's get to that component, and then any other questions you folks may have, you're welcome to get them into the Q and A box, and we'll ask those after this last component, and then we'll wrap it up. Thank you. All right, Dr. Ken, go for it. Okay. All right. This is a great um, uh, piece of my presentation. Again, there is so many. Um, students that would freeze or even clinicians. So first of all, you take out a tooth. It is not your fault that we have a sinus perforation. The tooth was in the sinus. Maybe it looked, you know, again, remember we talked about the PDL around the tooth and you can say it's not in the sinus. Maybe a little piece was in the sinus or was uh, sitting against the sinus floor. And, and when you took the tooth out, now you have a little oral enteral communication. What I like to do is first of all, when you typically, when you have an oral enteral uh, uh, sinus perforation, what you're perforating is your Schneiderian membrane. Rarely will you have a literally a, a blanket hole into the sinus because the Schneiderian membrane is pretty durable and, and that's not really compromised. So when you take out a, a palatal root, and uh, um, when you see, you take your high-speed suction, suction out that powder root, and when you see a gray and shiny apical tip to your socket, you now see the Schneiderian membrane. Above that piece of gray and shiny is the sinus, is an open cavity. And the next step is the brain. So um, again, I'm not trying to scare anybody, but I've never in 30 years had an issue if you, tr if you use this recipe, get your, so you take out your root tip and now you check for a, a, a perforation and you see gray and shiny, you don't see red anymore. And it's very, very obvious, gray and shiny. You see it and you, and you say, okay, keep the patient somewhat open or if they do wanna close, put some gauze in there. Try to prevent any bacteria from the oral cavity going into the sinus, okay? So let's, let's, let's do some damage control. So now we're gonna go ahead and, and get set up for a, um, um, an oral communication treatment. We resuction that, that socket out and we take a collagen plug. You know, and first of all, you wanna irrigate with some saline, but you don't wanna forcefully take that saline and just plow it up in there. Just gently irrigate some saline around the walls to make it somewhat clean. And then, because if you forcefully put that in there, you could pierce the Schneiderian memory and get all that saline up to the sinus. So you don't want to do that. So get your um, a gentle wash with saline. Then you want to take your collagen plug and you want to, it looks like a, like a bullet. You want to squeeze the round end a little bit. Then you want to take half of your collagen tape and you want to um, wrap tape around your plug and the very tips you want to spin to a point twist to a point then you want to take your plug with a twisted collagen tape end and put it up into the sinus don't squeeze your plug anymore keep it whole and wide to make it snug against the walls of that palatal root put it up into the sinus that twisted collagen tape end is going to sit right up against your Schneiderian membrane. And it's kind of going to want to seal that off. And it's going to give the epithelium 
a little opportunity to grow over that Schneiderian membrane and to cause a um, 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 repair, repair of that perforation. So again, take a cow's and plug, wrap your cow's and tape and twist it to a point. Take your plug, put it into the socket. Now, some clinicians will cut off their plug because it's too long. You could do that. I've done that. But sometimes lately, what I do with the students is I take the remainder of the cows and plug that sticks out of the palatal socket and I bend it into the buckle sockets. It's, it's there. Let's just use it. It's, it's, it's all going to be resorbed. So just do it. Then I fill the other buckle sockets with, with um, gel foam. Then after I have all that in place, I take the other half of my collagen tape, put it over the, the, uh, um, the occlusal part of the socket and suture it all in place like you're doing a bone graft. And believe me, you do about, now don't get me wrong, not two sutures. I'll use four to six sutures to keep that collagen tape intact. In my 30 years, I've never had a sinus oral community that have not healed over. And most of the time in about a week, max a month, but typically a week to two weeks, they heal over and they're good. Patient is asymptomatic, never even experienced anything from day one. Okay. Um, I think I, I haven't even read my slide, but I think I covered it all. I will make sure Okay, here's the treatment that I just described. It's all there. And before I exit out of this PowerPoint, I want to just um, 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 advertise a cool little town in the Midwest of Illinois, uh, the northern tip near Iowa. Uh, it's called Galena, Illinois. P I'm from here. I live at the very, so if you look at Tower, that's the old school. That's where I live. I live in second grade and my wife and I and Benny, and it's wonderful. It's, it's a very historical building and just, just love it. And there's the town and it's like living in Colorado. So you people from Colorado, I have it right here. But I live up in that in that old school, and uh, I live in in second grade, and I have a picture of 1940 of the students sitting in my living room. So, any if you're ever in the Midwest, uh, try to make Galena one of your stops. You wouldn't regret it. Here, that's the summer view, and here's the winter view. And again, there's my the tower. If you look straight above toward the center of the slide, and that is it. So I will exit out and I can take any questions. I love your shameless plug, Dr. Ken of Galena. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it looks right. gorgeous. It looks so beautiful there. It is. Okay, wonderful. All right, folks, we still have quite a bit of students. On. Thank you so much for hanging in there and listening to Dr. Ken's um, awesome webinar. We still have 60 students on. So you kept them very much engaged, Dr. Ken. Great job. Uh, we Thank have you. questions that have rolled in. Um, any, anybody else that has any questions you want to um, ask Dr. Ken, please feel free to ask them in the Q&A box right at the bottom. We'll just take a few more minutes to answer some questions and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. Um, uh, I guess dry socket dressing, is this done after local anesthesia? Um, well, I don't even like to use anesthesia. Good point. I'm sorry I didn't mention it. I'm sorry. Um, I be the, here's for the simple reason that when you saline the socket out, the patient does not feel anything. And then if you, you're, you're just syringing some paste in, so you're not even touching the walls of the socket, you put some gel foam in there and that's very atraumatic. The only, the only thing if, if you need to, you know, again, as you become seasoned, you can suture sometimes without anesthetic, but so go ahead and put the dry socket paste and put the gel foam, maybe put some collagen tape, keep them somewhat dry, not full of saliva. They should tell you they're asymptomatic. It's all gone away. Then you can maybe go ahead and put some infiltration of septocaine around the buckle and lingual flap and go ahead and suture. 
but great question. I'm sorry, I didn't, I forgot to uh, talk about that. No worries. Okay. If there's exposure of the sinus, do you prescribe antibiotics after placing the collagen? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, there's different, uh, different uh, recipes on ferret antibiotic. Um, I, you know, the go-to is always amoxicillin and probably I prescribe amoxicillin most of the time, but um, there's been time doing augmentin and z -Pack, azithromycin, because it's a good um, maxillary sinus um, antibiotic. Wonderful. All right. Just a few more questions, guys. If, if there's anything else you want to ask Dr. Ken, this is your chance. You can also ask it anonymously if you don't want to post it. Um, you want your name to pop up. Either or, we'll just take a few more minutes to answer these questions and then we are all done. Um, Crystal says Galena is amazing, of course. Okay. <laughs> okay. In your 30s. But, but you didn't visit me, Crystal, so you have to come and visit. She says she's going to come out there and take you and, uh, and your wife out to dinner sometime. Okay. Absolutely. Um, okay. This is asking In your 30 years of experience, what do general dentists typically do wrong when challenging a mandibular third molar bony impacted extraction? Nerve injury, poor post-operative care, trism infection, damage to proximal second molar? In your 30 years of experience, what do general dentists typically do wrong when challenging a mandibular third molar partially bony impacted extraction? Okay, so I'm gonna preface this by saying Typically, we lost you, Dr. Ken. <laughs> Dr. Ken, Dr. Ken. Oh, it, it, it's a very Dr. Um, Ken. Yes, we completely lost your audio, so you need to oh. start at the beginning. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. So first of all, general dentists do not take out uh, partial bony impacted thirds. And uh, have I taken some out? Absolutely. Do I take them all out? Absolutely. No, I take out probably 25% of them what I see. I pick and choose my battles. Um, you know, in this world that we live in, you have to be very, very cautious. And I just want to tell the students, I I'm not saying don't take them out, but just understand how much bone you're going to have to remove to get these teeth out. Because if you envision you're gonna remove maybe three millimeters of bone, double it. Because it always, you know, you're gonna to have to, you have to double it because it just happens. You, you haven't removed enough. So pick and choose your battles. I love to remove soft tissue impactions much more than bony impactions. When you remove bony impacted thirds, I guarantee you, um, a traumatic or, or traumatic uh, post-operative uh, symptoms develop, uh, dry sockets and and just achy. Um, and, and so I, I really don't, and I don't know enough about partial bony impactions to really comment. I do soft tissue impactions and I, I've done partial bonies, but probably 25 in the last 30 years total. Okay. Um, this student, I'm assuming it's a student, uh, they're just saying they want to say thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and teaching. Um, I've learned more out of this than I did out of my oral surgery class. So. Oh, well, thank you. That's anytime, awesome. Give them my, my email anytime I can, if, if I can answer any questions, I will be more than happy. You know, I'm just a small time dentist. I don't think that I'm a big operator. I'm so fortunate that Aspen is allowing me to do this and keeping me on board as a part-timer. I love Aspen and you can, you can uh, the, the two ladies involved here can tell you, I'm, I'm glad I have a job and I just try to do my very best and in a safe manner. Absolutely, love it. Okay, we have two more questions. Um, zithromycin dosage, question mark. Uh, azithromycin, you're, you're Zithro, zithromycin dosage. Oh yeah, yeah, it's it's azithromycin, uh, mm. um, uh, five hundred milligrams, and uh, it's a, a Z pack they call it. I think it's it's uh, three days, three uh, three tablets the first day, two tablets, and then one tablet the third day. And okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, what medications do you suggest for people allergic to penicillin and clomidacine? Okay, um, I would go with. Uh, um, so allergic to penicillin and 
clindamycin? Yeah. What did, okay. Um, oh boy, that's a toughie. Oh, that's the last question. It's a tough one. I haven't. Um, I yeah. I think augmentin would be appropriate. I I I, I don't know. I'm not going to try to BS you. I don't know. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. I have not had a patient in a long, long time that was allergic to penicillin and clindamycin. So um, I, I don't, I can't give you a good answer. I'm sorry. Okay, that means you have to do some research, Dr. Ken. Yeah. Okay, we are all done. Dr. Uh, Ken Heidia says that you were amazing and you prepared her so well for real life dentistry. And we have another doctor that said, thank you so much. This was very informative. Very good. Well, you're quite welcome. And uh, hopefully I can do it again. Absolutely. Okay, guys, thank you so much for jump, jumping on. We're going to do a quick raffle. We still have about 60 students on. Um, so I will have you pick three numbers, Dr. Ken, between one and 58, and we'll call out those winners. So okay. three numbers between one and 58. Okay. So 13. Okay. Um, 21 mm -hmm. and 39. All right, let's do a randomizer here and get these folks that have won. Okay, Brianna Smith. Brianna Smith, um, shoot me a message. Let me know that you are still, it says you're still on, but shoot me a message with your school in the chat box. You are one of our winners. And then we have uh, Forrest Quick. <laughs> oh, I know him. Forrest, good job. You're one of our winners. And our last winner is Curran Burke. Curran Burke. All right, so if you guys have won, if your name was called, shoot me a message um, and I will be sending you a $100 Amazon gift card. I'll shoot it over to you um, via email here shortly. Awesome, so we have Curran is from Midwestern Arizona. Okay. Forrest is from Midwestern Illinois and Brianna is from ECU. And this was not fixed. <laughs> I love it. All right, guys, great job. Great questions, Dr. Ken, you were fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, you're welcome, okay. We had tons of students that asked if we could um, share this recording with them. Are you okay with me sending that off? Sure. Wonderful, okay. Beautiful, Dr. Ken, you've been fantastic. Thank you so much. You you're have a wonderful- You're welcome. Okay, good night. Thank you. Good night. All right. All right, guys, thank you again so much for my winners. I will shoot you guys over a gift card here shortly. Um, and I will be sending out this recording as well. So you guys are able to watch it again if you'd like. Thank you so much for logging in tonight. Have a great night.